we could say that, that Dr. Wallace doesn't need an introduction, and, and there is some truth to that. But we always uh, kind of formally introduce our speakers and their academic background. Um, so uh, Dr. Wallace started his career as an undergrad uh, at Azusa Pacific University uh, a long time ago. Um, graduated here in 76. The, uh, his academic record then is a uh, master's from APU in business administration, uh, a doctor of business administration from uh, United States International University in San Diego. Um, and uh, I think uh, you will really appreciate the things he has to say today. And so John, if you would come and uh, entertain us. How do you do a last lecture? I mean, really, we, I could give you an exhaustive list of all of the things I hope you uh, take with you when you leave or the things that I think you ought to uh, accumulate once you uh, graduate. So instead, I thought I'll talk about four things. And, and so they're pretty simple topics. Uh, it'll be easy for you to make an outline if you choose to do so. Uh, but I think they capture for me what I hope happens for women and men who are committed to uh, a life of difference and committed to exercise the gifts that I think all of you represent uh, in this room today. So, um, so my last lecture. Uh, we're all created in the image of God. So why is this important? It's important because the basic, fundamental, foundational, theological truth that we share in this room is that God breathed his image into humankind. That we all have the imago Dei, the fingerprint of God on us. And the, the power around that idea is that, um, that it causes me to think with respect and admiration and appreciation for others of the humankind who I come in contact with who, um, who may or may not be like me, often are not, who may or may not agree with me, often do not, who may or may not um, uh, uh, see the world as I see it, often don't. Uh, but I got to say, sometimes the history of the faith community of, of the church over the last 2,000 years of women and men who come together because of their understanding of the redemptive plan of God for the world called to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Sometimes our history has not been that we see the image of God in everybody, but that we decide who's in and who's out. And I think that the power of, um, the power of what it means to be a gifted young adult prepared for the vocation God has called you to is that everybody you come in contact with is created in the image of God. So this is Namvula. Namvula is a go-go. So in South Africa, the grandparents are called Gogos, and when the pandemic of AIDS swept the African continent, it was the grandparents, primarily the grandmothers, who stepped in and cared for an entire generation that didn't have moms and dads because they, they met an early death. We're standing behind her little house. When we first started working with Nambula, she is a part of a community called uh, River of Life, it was one room, and we have added uh, rooms, and now where this, uh, this picture was taken a couple years ago, now that enclosed or covered patio is an additional room. Nambula is a single grandmother who cares daily for about 15 children. When we first met Nambula, uh, her backyard was a, her kitchen was a, was a fire pit with a metal pot, and Nambula invited any of those grandchildren who didn't have parents in her township I should say within a three block area of her home in her township because there were certainly a lot more uh, parentless children than um, 15 to come to her home and every single day she cared for them. Her neighbors would uh, bring cornmeal and, and, uh, and whatever pieces of protein they could and they put it in the pot. But children knew that they could come to Gogo Namvula's house and she would care for them, that they had a future because she saw in them the image of God. Nambula has, uh, we've been in relationship with her for uh, probably a decade now, uh, given our, our relationship with Riv Life in, um, in this township just outside of Peter Meritsburg in South Africa. 
And during that time, we have added to her home because we've seen the evidence that, that the people that Nambula comes in contact with are transformed. Their needs are met, but she loves people. I mean, she's like, she's like four foot nine, four foot, maybe five, I don't know, she's not five feet tall. She, but she is, uh, she is a tower of um, character and you wanna be near her. You want her to see you. Because when Namvula sees you, she really sees you. The greeting in South Africa when you see someone is Salbona. Salbona. Our greeting here in the uh, States is, hi, how are you? And, and by the way, we don't want them to tell us how they are because we're in a hurry going past them. Salbona means I see you. I see you. Isn't that a great greeting? Not, hi, how are you? But, hey, I, I see you. And in the, in the basic fundamental understanding of that culture and of that greeting, it isn't, hey, I see you, you have a checkered shirt on today, or I see you, you have a chartreuse skirt on today, or I see you, you have long hair, short hair. It is, I see you, you are a person. And the greeting back is, I see you, you're a person. For the Christ follower, for the woman and man who is committed to a life of obedience led by the Holy Spirit, if we don't see each other created in the image of God with his fingerprint, then we uh, join that hectic, faceless crowd that are on a treadmill of, um, of self-centeredness. So the first thing I would say to you in my last lecture is that we are all created in the image of God. And to live that out, we need to see each other and be available to each other in ways that my hero, Nambula, is available not just to the children uh, within a two or three block radius of her little um, home, uh, but to anyone that God puts in our path. Uh, we're created in the image of God. Uh, two. Remember, these are four points. That was the first one. This is the second one. Feel free to write these down. Uh, some things are temporary and others more permanent. Invest in one more than the other. So here's the thing. I, uh, you know, I'm, I just turned 64. I mean, that in itself is a miracle. Uh, just ask Dr. Milhan. He's gone hill, downhill fast with his hair on fire with me a couple times. Uh, we used to run down hills. Come, you know where the cross is up there? We would hike that back trail, and then there was a long steep hill. We would, run, we would race each other down a steep incline because we were idiots. <laughs> and um, a hip replacement and knee replacement later, we no longer run down that hill with our hair on fire. Um, but there are some things in life that are temporary and some things in life that are permanent. So... Uh, and that's an important statement because uh, culture and society actually kind of say a different thing about that. And, and culture and society, I mean, my degrees are all in business. I'm a, I, I took the marketing classes. My dissertation is about marketing uh, higher education to uh, adult students. Um, the message often in culture and society is that temporary things are the most important thing. So spend your money on the, this gadget or on on this design element, or on this location for your house, or on this kind of car you're gonna drive, or hang out with, with this group of people. There are some things that are temporary and some things that are permanent. So, uh, you know, probably for the students in this room, you are not yet at having uh, procreated. I have, I'm 64. These are my grandchildren, if I had known, Gail and I had known uh, how much fun grandchildren would be, we would have started with them, for sure. Um, they're certainly a lot, uh, uh, at points, easier than uh, children. But this was an example, uh, this was our Christmas card from uh, December. You may have gotten this Christmas card because as president, I shamelessly promoted my grandchildren on the university Christmas card. So one example of things that are permanent uh, is family. As a matter of fact, I would say to you um, what I say 
to students in the senior SEM class I teach or in the discipleship group I'm a part of, it may very well be that the most important thing you do in your life uh, is to get married, have children, and raise a family. As I think about all of the opportunities that currently exist in the world today, I actually believe that a strong family, moms and dads and kids who, uh, who grow up in whole and healthy community, have an opportunity and an advantage to make a difference in the world. But that's just one example of, of things that are uh, permanent. So I'm gonna suggest that character is something that's permanent. Kind of lines with our faith, that there, is a, um, that there is a permanence around who God is creating us and, and growing us up into. And, one, and when I say, you know, some things are temporary and some things are permanent, invest more in one than the other. To invest in a more permanent uh, faith position and growth in character, there are some opportunities of fellowship and disciplines and the kinds of uh, communities we are a part of where we receive instruction and guidance and accountability. <coughs> some things are temporary, some things are permanent. Invest in one more than the other. Uh, decide early. Uh, what you want to be known for, uh, what you possess, uh, or what you give away. I'm 64. I think I've said that now four times. I'm thinking about what comes next after being a president for 18 or 19 or 20 years, because probably at some point, you know. So Gail and I, my uh, wife of 42 years, uh, she, is, uh, she is an organized person. I mean, our bookshelves and the, the, her dresser in our bedroom and uh, her car as opposed to my car. I mean, it's really organized. And Gail's favorite thing to, in life, one of her favorite things in life, is to throw things away or give things away. Uh, so uh, last year, we decided, uh, Gail decided that we would go through our closets. Uh, I, I need to, I'm just the opposite of Gail. I grew up on a farm, as John mentioned. Uh, farmers have this, uh, men and women who farm have a big barn typically on their property and they have a bone pile. Do you know what a bone pile is? A bone pile is all of the old things that wore out but you put it there because someday you're gonna need a part out of the bone pile. You're gonna need a, a bolt or a nut or a screw or a big piece of metal that came off of this machine. And by the way, farmers, men and women who are in agriculture, their, their bone pile is pretty active. They actually take things that are old and rusted, they clean them up and they use them when a part breaks. So I grew up with a bone pile. You didn't throw anything away. 42 years later in our marriage, I have, I have uh, stuffed every corner of our house full of things. It drives Gail crazy. She, she says to me, look, uh, we're going to leave this house. We're going to go to a smaller house. It's going to be more manageable. And she said, go through the discipline of giving something away. So I did. I filled, I filled a big trash bag uh, that we're going to take to the uh, Goodwill store of old clothes. Gail filled four trash bags. And I felt like I had given away a kidney to get to that point. <laughs> uh, because the fact is, it's not just farmers. We are uh, kind of taught and grow up in a culture and a society where the accumulation of things kind of defines us. And, and we like to pull them out and kind of show them off. I do. And, uh, and the problem is that, um, that if you think of life kind of like a uh, backpacking trip, and in your uh, backpack, you only have so much room, right? And uh, you can keep piling things in, but at some point there's more than you can fit or at least more than you can carry. And as you move through life, it's the ability, the ability to accept new opportunities and even new learning. And in some cases, uh, new places to live and new friendship it often relies on being able to let go of other stuff. So if we were uh, backpacking, does anybody know what this is besides John? Karen, yeah, C-A-I-R-N, Rock Karen. Uh, do you know what purpose they serve? They mark a trail. It actually comes from a tradition of Native Americans who not only would mark a trail, but when something significant happened in a location and they wanted to remember the significance of that location, uh, they would 
at Iraq. And some of these locations were um, gathering places. So where rocks accumulated, it marked these significant opportunities and occurrences. Today, if you were to go in the back country, the Ansel Adams or Yosemite or you know, just about anywhere um, in North America, and I, and I have seen them on some treks in Europe as well, um, they are precious because you can lose your way easily on trails that over a hard surface are not well marked. Kate and I, my daughter and I, were hiking in the back country of Yosemite. This is just past a, a pass that separates uh, Ansel Adams from uh, Yosemite. It's about 12,000 feet. And it was certainly a, you know, it wasn't across a green meadow. Was against, and we lost our way. We couldn't find our way. We had to find a Karen to Karen to Karen. But at some point, somebody had to leave that behind for us to find our way. And what they left behind allowed us to pick up a memory. But there's also this leaving behind because we can only carry so much. I think that uh, one of the basic human conditions that Jesus came to save us from <coughs> is the human condition of selfishness. And a life that's surrendered to the cause of Christ and to the work of the Holy Spirit um, I meet a lot of people, and honestly, one of the things that stands out to me or not is how do, they, how do they deal with selflessness and selfishness? And the basic nature, in my opinion, of the human condition is me first and others second. And as I move through life, I have learned how, I have learned the necessity of giving things away so that I can accept sometimes the responsibilities and burdens of others. But if my arms are so full of me, if I haven't left some of me behind, I won't have room for others. Does that make sense? And the discipline, the art of letting go and leaving things behind and opening up space, not just in our backpack, but opening up space in our soul and in the relational fabric of who God has called us to be, if we, if we don't learn the discipline and maturation of winnowing, of letting go of those things that, um, that quite honestly need to be let go of, we're not going to have room for the other stuff. I am guilty of many things. And uh, if you were in the discipleship group with me, we practice the discipline of confession together. Nine guys meet on Fridays, and one of the things we do is we confess our sins. Sometimes uh, I, you would hear me confess that, um, that one of the things I'm guilty of is uh, muchness. Muchness is uh, adding to all of the stuff I do and the busyness of my day. Uh, I am learning the importance of uh, less over more and empty places in my life that God can use to, fear, to fill. So decide, um, decide early uh, what you want to be known for. Success is not final and failure is not fatal. I've been working with college students for more than 40 years. Uh, have you ever had that moment when Scott Kennis gave you an A? Actually, that's a bad example. I don't think there are any. Um, <laughs> Uh, there are moments in life when you have arrived. Seriously. You, you, you grab the brass ring. Um, what you were aiming for came true. Your hard work, what you stacked up against that moment when all of you needed to show up, did. And you, and you got an A plus from, I don't know, somebody other than Kenneth. <laughs> uh, and you have had those moments, perhaps, uh, when, um, when the world caved in. Uh, I don't know what it was. Maybe, um, maybe a family member went to heaven sooner than you were expecting, or maybe, uh, maybe you had an act of public humiliation, which, by the way, when they... When surveys are done of, um, of people in our culture and society, that's near the top of the list. I don't want to be publicly humiliated. Or maybe, um, maybe in this era of social media, um, there was something that happened that everybody jumped on about you 
um, or about something you were a part of and, and you in that moment felt like a failure. Or maybe um, the failure that cuts to the heart of all of us is when we want someone or something to say yes to us and they say no. <coughs> or if we get left behind. Uh, here's what I want to say about this. Uh, a lot of studies have been done around what it means to be a resilient person, a person who is able to handle um, both success and failure. Um, we have to understand that, that while success is often a reflection of excellence that brought us to a point of an A and we can build on that, so is failure. Matter of fact, if I were to ask you in this room, so what's your best lesson over the last 12 months? I mean, if, if we had time to sit down over a cup of coffee and we unpacked who you have been over the last year, I'm just gonna bet that your biggest learning wasn't around success. Your biggest learning was around that time when it felt like you were in deep water. At least that's how it is for me, typically. And, and in that moment, in that season, in that uh, dark place, uh, you've just got to understand that neither one of those are a final place. Success certainly puts us in the right direction, and, and failure certainly has some great lessons for us when we can understand that, but neither one of them are permanent. But both of them help mold us and shape us into that person and character that God wants us to be. How many of you did the candela? We do that twice, right? We do that on move-in weekend. It's one of my favorite things. This looks like uh, move-in weekend. But we do it again with seniors when you graduate. Uh, because we say that life that we are preparing you for with the, not just the academic major you leave, you leave with, but the experiences at APU that shaped your character and helped you understand the fabric of relationship that's been put in your lap and, and the experiences of success and failure while you're here, that what we really expect of you is that you will shine, that there will be a light from you, that your life will be something that provides something for somebody else. I love it. I, I just love the candela. I love it because, uh, because it's pretty cool to see what happens when one flame moves uh, at, at the New Student Weekend. You know, that's almost 4,000 people that gather out there in that graduation ceremony for seniors that Friday night before the Saturday. Maybe there's 1,000 of us, parents and students. I love that. The, the call we have um, uh, going forward. Uh, this is my life verse, Galatians 2.20. Uh, for I've been crucified with Christ, but I no longer live. It's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. Part of that verse, it says, and the life I now live. So if I was to plant something in you about uh, this last lecture, um, it would be that, uh, you know, you have been called to live a life. You remember this? Uh, it's one of my favorite parts of your weekend when you came as a new student. We gave you a piece of chalk, and when you left the event center that Sunday morning, we said, go create an altar on campus. If your family's with you, in, you know, your family will stand with you. If somebody's here that doesn't have a family, invite them into your circle. And so we have literally, you know, so we send a photographer around. We've been doing this a number of years. We have hundreds of these pictures. This is one of my favorite. Look at all of the dreams and aspirations, the thoughtful, I'm gonna pull this onto the altar for this season at APU. Look, I mean, I, Aloha, there must be a Pacific Islander in there. That compass bearing there, the Ohana family, the endurance, somebody named Jamie. So this life we now live, that passage from Galatians 2.20, that's your life. In some ways, I, I wish that um, you would sign a covenantal agreement with the university that says once you graduate, wherever it is that God plants you, the apartment complex for grad school or the, the place you're going to work is with the discipline that you've mastered, I would like a, I'd, like to, I'd like you to graduate with a piece of chalk and that you would be accountable 
to create an altar for that next phase of your life, and you would pull into that altar the things that, that really need to be all in for God. And that, and that that would be a reminder of that sacred place um, for that season of your life, as this has been a sacred place for this season of your life. So I want to say I'm proud of you. Um, you have chosen a, a challenging academic path. And the stories that come from alum who graduate with your major are pretty significant. The God-honoring excellence that you um, are crafted with by these faculty in this program prepare you to be a light in a God-honoring way when you leave. Um, and one of the most, uh, John, when you're talking about an alum from 2005 coming back to present a paper of excellence, I mean, that, those are the stories that just feed us. So that's my last lecture for you. Um, I pray I pray that you will be fully surrendered. That you'll be known by what you give away, not by what you keep. That you'll invest in permanent, not temporary. That you'll learn to leave things behind so you can hold on to things that need to come into your life that are new. And that uh, wherever God plants you, there will be a place for that altar to hold all of your hopes and promises for the next phase. And that's what I hope for you. You've had a, had a, a number of uh, struggles health-wise. It's true. Um, uh, some where you needed uh, you know, a fair amount of help from the outside. Uh, got in trouble in the back country, had to be helped out. Uh, you know, cancer, cancer chemotherapy, surgery. Uh, most important lesson you learned from, from you know, health issues. Yeah, so I'm a pretty private person. Uh, I don't often ask for help. So probably in all of those health things, one of the things I learned is that, um, that we all need each other. When I was, um, so in, in 2015, when I was diagnosed with uh, cancer and there was surgery and um, chemo, and then radiation, I was also uh, teaching that senior sim class. So I said to the students, hey, who would like to go with me to my everyday radiation? You know, you do that for almost a month, right? And students in my class signed up. And we would drive down to Norris and have conversations about life and stuff. So here's the president of the university undergoing cancer treatments and students going with him and, and, and in the Norris Cancer Center, there's a whole area just for radiation. And so on some days, the, my car would have four or five or six. One day, all eight guys from the D group went. So that the, the person at the reception desk who you check in with, every day uh, she would say, who do you have today? <laughs> By the second week, the, the physician that was, uh, the radiologist that was treating me <clears throat> um, came out and, and she, would want to meet those students every day. And I was thinking, even in that moment, the fact that uh, the people who, who walked a path of obedience to Christ brought really a, a pretty remarkable bright light to a radiation center uh, every day of the week. Yeah, so we need each other. And, and um, as much as I would like to run and hide, I can't do that. You have had a variety of jobs on campus. Um, most of your life. Can you talk about um, what was the job that brought you the most joy and satisfaction in all of your employment at the university? Yeah, easy. I um, driving a bus. Uh, so I, I uh, was a farm boy. I came with a class one license and I could make money. By the way, I didn't go to Azusa Pacific University as an undergrad. I went to Azusa Pacific College. Uh, we were not yet a university. Um, and uh, I, could, I could drive buses. Uh, so I drove primarily for the music choirs. And uh, that's how I met my wife, Gail. She was in Bel Canto, and I drove for Bel Canto. Uh, but what I loved about driving bus is that, um, that you, you set out together. You get to a place together. You set up for the concert. You bring out the risers. 
together you celebrate the concert, you get back home. So in one evening, community from start to finish was possible. And I love when something can be packaged like that. Um, yeah, bus driver. Um, how do you know or feel that you are exactly where God wants you? <laughs> yeah, what's God's will for my life? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah. Uh, that's especially important when uh, when we fall in love, right? Is this the one, or did I miss the train on the one that she was on? Or, uh, yeah. So I got to tell you something about God's will. I think He values obedience first, and so obedience is being available. Um, so I I've known so. I knew John as a student, right? I, I knew him when he fell in love with Tammy. I knew, I knew them in, in their wedding and, and marriage. I knew them in his postdoc when he went to University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and so John is a good example of someone who I think um, was obedient in his availability. And then, so I think God works, I think God will either nudge us in a direction or make us uncomfortable so we leave the place we're at. God's will is not as elusive as we think. Uh, you know, that's why we use Micah 6.8 in the beginning of the year. God's will is that we be people of justice. We extend love of another kind and mercy and that, and that our humility puts others first. I think that's more God's will than what school should I go to? Um, and uh, having said that, <clears throat> I believe in wise counsel. I mean, I have people, if you think about it, every day I get up and I look in a mirror and the best I get is my reflection, right? But there are people who look directly at me, who know me on a daily basis, and, and I will ask them what they think. I'll say, look, you know me well enough. What are the warts and wrinkles you see? What are the cautions you would give me? What are the encouragement? And I have found that, um, that wise counsel from people who know me can help in that and those decisions around God's will. What is something that you've always wanted to say or a word you wanted to give to the up and coming Christian scientist? Yeah. So science, yeah, here, I'm a business major. I'm gonna tell you what science is, right? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I sat in here once and listened to a lecture from a, a Nobel laureate that was invited to campus. And I remember that he began that lesson by pointing to students in the room and the, and the science or biology or chemistry textbook that was in front of them. And he said, your job is to disprove what's in this book. That, that science is, is, is challenging what we know and discovering what we don't. Uh, I think along the way, Science needs to not just ask, can we do this, but should we do this? Um, but thank goodness, thank goodness, science has brought us where we are in many, I mean, honestly, uh, I mean, I'm here today because of a chronic illness that is manageable, cancer that is being treated, right? I mean, that's an outcome of good science. Uh, so I, I'm not afraid of science, uh, but I am encouraged by Christ followers who who see the image of God in science as they see the image of God in each other. I guess that's what I'd say. But I'm a business guy. Check that with Milhan or Kenneth. They... How long did it take you to realize that failure was a good teacher in that system? <laughs> yeah, how long did it take me to learn that? I don't, I, um, yeah. I am the product of mentoring. So I told you that I, I took the job as custodian because of the faculty member. We, had, we actually had a 10-year mentoring relationship where at least twice, so I had other jobs here at the university, at least twice a week we would meet. So I was married and when Gail was looking for me, she would call his office. Uh, that was in the day before cell phones like Milhan is today. Um, <laughs> oh, that's not true, you have a cell phone now. I broke it, so. Okay, all right. Um, <laughs> And after Tim, a guy named Ted Ingstrom, whose name is on Ingstrom Hall, and after Ted, a pastor in the Midwest, and after that pastor in the Midwest, uh, the president before me, um, those mentors really were the ones who helped me capture 
the meaning of failure. Uh, and, and, uh, and honestly, Gail, I mean, I was 21, she was 19. And, uh, you know, uh, David, our firstborn, didn't come along for about another seven years. But, uh, but some of how I handled failure was learning from Gail in, in the most intimate of relationships, which is marriage. Uh, and, and certainly, I believe that success and failure at home can impact success and failure in your vocation and, and vice versa. But uh, mentors who spoke into my life and a uh, life mate who. <laughs> so mine, I guess it's kind of a tough question. So to be honest, a lot of us in science, I know is in my senior class, we have, we're struggling with things. We're having these And I don't want to blame our education on that, but our, so much of our degrees in this room is focused on facts and objectivity and things you can measure and observe um, and support and we go to translate that to our theological life and it there's there's an issue yeah yeah right in there and because I think a lot of us view the Bible as less of fact more of more subjective than your reading of science textbooks and so since we're so program at this point to look for facts, to look for logic, and then we go to faith, there's not a lot of that coming back. What, how, how do you, I guess my question is, how do we reconcile that later on when we don't have chapel income and faith in religion? Yeah. Boy, that is a really good question. You should have asked that first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. i give you a gold star. Uh, so, uh, so you, in many ways, have already framed the answer. So let me just say this, that in my walk, my, um, my life as a Christ follower, I, I came to faith when I was five. I don't think I understood it until I had a, a youth pastor who really spoke into me in high school. I mean, so came to faith in five, understood it in high school. <clears throat> uh, in my uh, walk with Christ, um, uh, framing the question has been as important as finding the answer. So the, the very fact that you said, look, we understand that the Bible isn't supposed to be read in the same way our science book is read, right? But I'll have to say, you know, I... Um, so if tomorrow we discover extraterrestrial life, it does not shake my faith. If tomorrow um, somebody digs up a clay pot somewhere in the world that says something that seems to be at dissonance with, with the core truths of Scripture, God's story for humankind, that doesn't shake my faith. What typically shakes my faith when I get to a place of doubt is, um, is when I can't seem to find a way out of the box I'm in. Because if God, uh, in his sovereignty and his care and attention of me, is all of who I understand him to be, why am I at this stuck place? So I will say to you what I have said to myself and what others have said to me along the way. <clears throat> Fortunately, there are a lot who have come before us who have struggled with the same questions and have left some really important uh, Karens, some markers for us. Um, so there's this guy named St. John's of the Cross. He's an early church father. <clears throat> we know him because he, in his journal, describes a dark night of the soul. And, and he is an absolute dedicated um, disciple who lives a monastic experience so that he can be fully available to God. And he goes then into prayer, as has been his tradition, and he cannot find God. He is fully available. The same patterns of spiritual discipline that have brought him to God before fail him. And for a season, I mean a long season, he can't find God. His whole life is built on, his, I mean, you can't be who he is, can't, right? <clears throat> and in his uh, writing, he gives us a glimpse of the power of doubt. And so I will say to you that I believe God honors honest doubt 
as much as he honors all of the praises of all of the angels. And I think in your own or our own uh, development as a disciple of Christ, that we're just going to have to realize that, that, that God gave us doubt for a reason. As God gave us curiosity and the scientific method and the opportunity to prove or disprove theory, um, And so as the discipline of staying um, up late to prepare for a final prepares you as a student, so does the discipline of staying fully present in your doubt. And, um, and have some people around you who, who, who have full attention to your soul uh, in ways that you trust. And I, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry that I'm going to say what I'm, but I hope you have seasons of doubt that allow you to build big muscles of faith. They will be bigger than without. All right. Sorry to take all your time. Uh, <clears throat> so may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. And between now and the end of this semester, bring you a wholeness, a shalom. Thank you for having me.